awkward silence. <coughs> hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of Studio Sessions here at Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. My name is Maria Elisa. I am the Curatorial Fellow here at the Craft Center, and today I am joined with Nicole Amir in her studio. Um, we really appreciate everybody tuning in to this edition. Um, for those who are tuning in for the first time, Studio Sessions are a series of informal conversations with our resident artists about their practice, their process, and much, much more. Uh, one of the major components of our studio sessions is we highly encourage audience participation. So please, if you have any questions about Nicole, her work, or anything that might be interesting to talk about, please sound <laughs> off in the chat. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Um, so first, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. It is the beginning of September, so I wanted to share some cool events that we have coming up here at the Craft Center. Um, this Saturday, September 5th, we will be doing a hands-on Houston to-go. Um, we'll be handing out kits to make wet felted bead necklaces on a first-come, first-served basis from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Just pull into the back parking lot and let our staff know how many kids will be attending the event. Um, please do uh, check our website under the on the event page for more information about that hands-on Houston to go on September 5th from 11 to 1. Um, on the September 24th coming up, we've got Craft Chats, which is our inaugural series of lunchtime chats featuring our curatorial staff. The first one will feature Catherine Hall talking about breaking tradition, which will be on view in the front gallery. Again, um, another audience Q&A event, so we highly encourage you to tune in and ask questions about the exhibition. Uh, more information on that on the events page on our website. Finally, we've got on September 26th a melt and pour soap making workshop that will be led by Tarina Frank. Um, you, can, you have to register for this event to participate, so please do go to our website, again, the events page, to learn more and find out how to register for that workshop. Um, we'll be announcing more studio sessions for the fall coming up soon, so please stay tuned to our socials, our newsletter, sign up for it if you haven't already. And Right before we launch into it, we just want to thank you all so much for working with us and staying with us that we've been figuring out this brand new live streaming series. Um, as I know y'all are accustomed to, there are lots of weird connectivity things that happen, so please, uh, we beg your continued patience as we work through this time and figure out how to make these the best possible. Um, okay, so let's get started. <laughs> uh, today I'm hanging out with Nicole Amir. Um, originally from Verona, Wisconsin, Nicole received her BFA in Ceramics and Art Management from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and her MFA in Ceramics and Sculpture at Texas Tech in Lubbock. In addition to working in clay, Nicole harnesses natural processes like fermentation and is a very skilled mold maker, um, all of which I'm super, super excited to be here today to talk to Nicole about, so thank you so much for having us. Hey, no problem. Welcome. <laughs> Well, I thought that maybe just to like kick off the conversation, maybe you could just give us a little bit of like background about you know what got you interested in ceramics and sculpture, what kind of led you down the path that mm. led you here. Oh well, you know, I think um, some people might have like a very distinct experience where they're like, oh, I went to this painter pottery event, or my grandmother did this, and then that's why I'm interested in art. But I think it really um, just started because as a child I spent a lot of time outside um, and it wasn't like oh let's go to a playground or whatever it was like really like running into the woods getting lost in cornfields and um, playing with like sticks and <laughs> rocks and digging holes and I think um, because I just got really interested in um, switching up the environment or like making little tiny interventions is what we would call it. <laughs> as like a grad student, but as a child, it's I'm digging a hole. I'm going to hide my favorite pine cones that I don't want my brother to find. Or um, just like using my hands to like interact with the environment or mess around. Um, but I think also I'm just a really curious person and I'm always thinking like oh what does this do or how would these things interact together um, I recently made a really big mistake in the studio and we experienced it earlier um, so as Maria Lisa mentioned like I'm really into fermentation um, as a process and uh, I experiment a lot with kombucha and scobies um, just as like a quick show-and-tell this is my healthy mother. 
So it grows over the surface of whatever liquid. Usually the food is um, a tea and then some sugar. Um, but I kept wondering like, okay, so how did someone see this for the first time? How did someone like come across this thing? How does it grow in the wild? And so I grabbed some dirt and leaves and just compost from the craft garden and um, put it in a, a glass fermentation tank. And of the first day or two, it smelled all right. It kind of smelled like a really different kombucha. But then over time, the leaves started to decay. And now it's so bad. Um, it's full of the sense of life. <laughs> yeah. It's of the part of it, yeah, it's the part yeah. of the cycle of life. We yeah. accept it. Yeah. <laughs> so you never know like where a hunch will lead you. Sometimes it smells a lot. Um, well, on a personal note, I think it's really interesting that you grew up in a military family. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much moving around that entailed for you, but I grew up moving around a lot because my dad was a government worker. And I just was curious as to whether or not maybe that background had an influence on how you explored your lived mm -hmm. environment. Well, I didn't move around much per se, but um, when I did sort of like live, like, okay, this time is segmented is this kind of time, and then now there's a transition, and now I'm experiencing a different kind of place or a different kind of space, and I think um, it kind of developed this sort of uh, internal, like, time scale where I feel about every, like, couple of years where it's like, oh, time for an adventure, time to go see something new, experience something new. Um, I've been in Houston for maybe like three years now, and of course all of a sudden I'm like, I'm going to apply for a Fulbright to go to Japan. And so it's like time to like go and explore. And I think um, a part of that is always like, again, back to curiosity, like wanting to learn more experience more just like an openness to new yeah. experiences exploration discovery yeah and i mean we'll get into this more later but it really is a lot i feel like your work is about you know the exploration of things that like happen constantly all around mm -hmm. us but we're never really tuned into so i know we're going to get into that a little bit more later and i'm really excited about it but i'm really excited right now about this demo that you've kindly agreed <laughs> to share with us so do you want to tell right. us a little bit about what you're going to show us Sure thing. So um, first off, I'm just going to like sort of explain what the materials are. Um, plaster, um, this is one example of a plaster mold. Um, it is gypsum. When we find it out in the environment, it's a solid stone. Um, it's then excavated and taken to a factory to pulverize. So when you buy it from a store, it's going to come in a bag and it's going to look kind of like powdered sugar. Um, of course, you don't want to ever consume it. But um, so it's like the fluffy white powder. Uh, once we add water to it, it starts a chemical reaction and then it solidifies again. Now, this um, is also um, semi porous and um, it will bio, I don't know if it's biodegrade <laughs> because it's not necessarily biological but um, it will break apart. Um, so oftentimes, like, you might find mold makers who like toss like broken up chunks of plaster into their gardens because it actually like adds more to the soil. Um, so in terms of like processes being earth friendly or like trying not to <laughs> poison uh, the environment anymore, uh, plaster is Pretty friendly, I would have to say. Um, so this is uh, sort of like a press mold, so you can take solid clay and press into this. Um, same with this one part mold. Um, just to mention, um, so I have made 100 bowls for Empty Bowls Houston. Um, it's a great fundraising event, um, provides funding for the food bank and free meals, um, much needed right now. Why don't I give the audience a closer look at that beautiful yeah. bowl? Tell them all about it. And this is a uh, bubble glazing technique using cobalt. It is a Grolic porcelain, which means the whitest of white porcelain you can get. Um, artists donate all their work for free. Um, so 
I'm not going to get anything from this, but people can eat more. <laughs> so, so it's important. Um, we had to delay the, the event because of COVID, but um, it will be happening, and please keep a lookout. <laughs> so... So not to interrupt the demo, but yeah. you told me a little bit earlier about why this yeah. has that bubble kind of uh, surface. And I just yeah. thought it was really sweet. So I thought maybe you could share with the audience if you don't mind. Sure. So um, I usually like glaze things in like white, black, or like maybe some like strip of patterning. Um, but as I got like really stressed out with everything shutting down and all this uncertainty, um, I just was overcome with the desire to blow bubbles. Um, and so I did like a series of bubble drawings. Um, and then I glazed these bowls with <laughs> bubble glaze. Um, I don't see myself really continuing with bubbles, but let's see how long this lasts. So <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Um, okay. Back to molds, back to molds. Okay, so um, this is a one part mold. It means there's no other pieces. Um, you can either pour a liquid clay into this or you can press um, a solid clay. If you wanted to do casting in bronze or iron or aluminum, you could pour wax into this mold and then use that as a sculpture to cast. Um, or you can just make wax objects, which are beautiful as well. It all, like, the plaster is a very, um, adaptable material. And then, I'll demold this later, but, um, this is a tooth mold. This is a 3D printed wisdom tooth. Um, the Smithsonian has a really great online resource. Uh, they've scanned various objects, um, excavation sites, and so you can go online and see those as 3D models, or you can print them out as 3D objects. Do you mind if I give the audience a little bit yeah. of that, a little closer up? Get some big tooth action. We good? We good? <laughs> get the top of that. And, and it's mine! <laughs> <laughs> so don't steal it! It's my tooth! So Very cool. So don't take it. So just as a, as a caveat, I don't, I don't typically cast on this table. Um, you do kind of want it to be, <laughs> you do want it to be level. This is not level, but I'm going to do it anyway. So this is a casting slip. So it's a liquid clay, and you just pour it. And so as the plaster sucks up the water, the level of the casting slip will decrease and then you'll just want to top it off. Um, so that just hangs out. Uh, if you were making a large production, you would time how long it takes to make a bowl at a certain thickness and then just repeat. Uh, so, so you hang out. So like as it absorbs it and it like starts lowering the level of the slip in there and you top it up, at some point do you pour out the remainder or does yeah. over time it all get sucked in? Okay. So if I were to go to dinner and forget about this, what will happen is that all the water will be sucked into the plaster. However, the very top portion of the castable piece will be very thin and the very bottom will be very thick. So. Okay. Once it once it reaches that ideal thickness, you will want to pour it up, and you'll see that. Um. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, well, that's doing its thing. Um, I'm going to mention this mold again. Um, so uh, the piece I'll have installed in the craft garden, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, I actually learn a lot about the native uh, plants of Texas that we have in the garden. And this was one of my choices. Um, so I've made over a thousand, definitely over a thousand leaf fragments. Um, these are translucent porcelain. I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little close up. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so, so this is what we normally see as the top of the leaf. You want to go in a little closer and see what we can get all that veiny glory. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, so that's a flashlight, but a, the sun, sunlight would do similar things. And then this is what is the underside of the leaf. And so um, after doing testing and really trying to look very closely at uh, the leaf itself, the underside was more appealing to me, especially because it is more vascular in appearance. Um, what stands out more is the darker portions of the ceramic. Um, we, we are all vascular, <laughs> we are part of the vascular system, so even though um, there, there are leaves, it's, for me it is relating back to the body, the human body. Okay, so I'm going to say this is done. Normally you want a larger target to pour into, but we're gonna, call. we're gonna live life on the edge. Yeah. It's okay. 2020, baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Who Five cares? Comes. I love it. Who cares? I so, feel free. I feel so free. So, um, everything that's spilled, that's okay because I'm just gonna wait for it to dry. I can scrape it up and then put it back in water, and it it works again. So. And that process is known as reconstituting, if I'm not um, mistaken, or... Sure, maybe I am mistaken. No, no, no. I mean, to reconstitute something is to bring it back to the desired state. But um, clay people call it reclaiming. Reclaiming. <laughs> so so well, I don't care. Pull what you want. I'm gonna still. I'm gonna use this. She's gonna reclaim the clay. I'm gonna use that stuff, dear audience. Dear, dear audience. audience, it's not trash. Cool. Um, so let's see. So this is a multi-part mold. So if you try to like take plaster off of the clay surface and it just doesn't want to budge, that means it's still too wet. You gotta stop. Well, that, oh, wait. That's all good because we are in a good position to transition to talking about your other work, and then we can absolutely come back, see how this progress is going before we jump into our audience Q and A. So will you join me in? This side of the studio. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to this side of the studio. Welcome. <laughs> that was really interesting, Nicole. I really like feel like you have a great way of explaining how these things function. And you know, I've said this I feel like every single time I've done a studio session, it just comes up like, I don't know a lot about ceramics or mold making. And so having, you know, your experience always kind of unpack some of this process has been really great and really mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, but like I mentioned at the beginning, you aren't just a clay worker. You are really interested, and you said it earlier, maybe what we can do is bring out that SCOBY again, but you yeah. work with kombucha a lot. And these canvases behind you, uh, very distinctive, are in fact kombucha cultures that you grew and froze, right, to produce these works. So do you want to unpack a little bit of that process and that interest? Sure. So these are actually made in 2017. Um, and these were the first iterations of this work. I didn't freeze them. And oh. they, uh, especially this one, was very active. And it actually like gooped and like slimed onto the gallery floor. Um, so then. <laughs> After that, I decided, okay, so I have to stop this process. The, the mother, or the SCOBY, the somatic culture of bacteria and yeast, um, is extremely resilient. This is what I'm finding. Uh, the piece that was behind me on the wall while I was demoing, that is uh, about six or seven different SCOBYs, which have been layered and uh, fermented using different kinds of tea to get different kinds of colors. Um, and I think my interest comes from this way that they, uh, for me, like represent embodiment. Um, at first I was thinking about like, okay, so if I'm going to use that 
use embodiment in my work for questions about like physicality. Um, it's not bones, it's not blood, it's not sinew, it's not tissue, it's the entire thing. It's the entire body. So it's not parceled out, it is the entire thing. Uh, That's interesting. When you said that just now, it put me in mind of the mystery of the cocoon. When a, when a caterpillar yeah. undergoes metamorphosis, yeah. what's inside of there is unconstituted. It's literally like life goop. Yeah, and that's what, and actually maybe this is a good time to, do you mind if I give no, the no. audience? No, give them a close-up look at Mama, Mama Kombucha. This is what a SCOBY looks like, symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. It's very popular um, beverage among people who are <laughs> probiotic enthusiasts. Um, it's good. Pro-probiotic. But yeah, it's very much like a, it's like a home brew craft adjacent kind of thing that people engage in. Yeah. But the fact is that, yeah, the mother is the entire organism, but it seeds and it breeds this like ever increasing and ever yeah. blossoming thing outside of itself. And these are a really fascinating example of that because even in this one, you see like multiple iterations of its life, like sticking to the canvas, adhering to it, gooping on the floor, yeah. and then whatever happened after that. Right. Well, and what I find also so powerful is like within the kombucha tea, as long as you don't freeze it or refrigerate it, it has like almost this infinite possibility to regenerate or to create more mothers. So it's like what it's like the almost offspring or the result of the mother is also the mother, the moment the the first mother is taken off the surface and the, the liquid is exposed to tea. Um, I think that why I'm also super into tumbleweeds um, as like this, this plant that sort of propagates itself after dying. So the tumbleweed is like most West Texans uh, have come to really hate. Um, but but um, so it grows to maturity and then sort of like dislocates itself from its root system, effectively like ending its own life. And then as it tumbles, it spreads seed. So it's only creating more life after death. So and I don't know, like I don't know of any other species or organisms that do that. Um, but thinking a lot about like what is life or like what does it mean to have a conscious ex experience or I really want to dive into like the quasi religious like dimension of that, but maybe before <laughs> yeah. we can like yeah. show the yeah. audience an example of oh. what you, the work you do. So why don't we first of all unpack the process? So you get the tumbleweed material. Yeah. And then you slip cast it. Yeah, so I wrangle tumbleweeds from the wild, and then I dip them in um, a, a porcelain casting slip. So what I just poured into this bowl mold is what I'm dipping these plants into. Um, and then I fire them in a specific kind of kiln. Um, the tumbleweed burns out, and then what's left is this sort of like almost bone structure um, to the tumbleweed. So its original form is destroyed but it's sort of like given a new kind of body. Um, ceramic is a material that will last millennia, but it might not exist as like a beautiful vase or a figurative sculpture, but it will exist at least in part in shards. So uh, I can show you some. There's actually a really sweet story. Um, I gifted a piece to a friend and She's like, oh, I don't know what happened. It sort of like fell and exploded. So she collected all these little tiny pieces and gave them to me in this little Altoid store. <laughs> and it's like the intent was to fix it, um, but there was something so sweet about um, that sort of like getting on your hands and knees and like picking up all these pieces um, that it's like, Sorry, Jordan, <laughs> you're not getting it back. This is, this is it. Um, but I, it reminded me, like, as she's handing me this sort of, like, collected shards, 
of, uh, I had like a flashback to when I was in middle school, like cleaning the bathroom mirror and like climbing up on the counter to clean the very top edges and on the top drawer, the top shelf, and like in the corner there was like this collection of little teeth. And of course, of course I was so freaked out and startled by this like little pile of teeth. And so I, I asked my father, I'm like, what? What's, What's up, up with the that? teeth, Dad? What's up with that? That's like, that doesn't seem normal. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, those are your teeth. Like, those are your baby teeth. And so it was like this very odd moment of like these little perfect white, like bony, but like something that, yeah. something that was in my mouth and like allowed me to eat and grow and like mature and, and it was ex like out of my body. It was just like a very odd. It's like so a like, weird, you're like re-encountering a part of your body that yeah. was in you, yeah. but there's no recognition there, because why would there be? So you have this experience of like horror, like almost yeah. literally yeah. body horror, yeah. Yeah. and then to be told like, oh yeah, those are your teeth, it's like, oh, those are like a familiar, loving yeah. treasure for my parents, and I thought my dad was collecting random teeth, you know, <laughs> that's like a really incongruous, like, yeah. what, what constitutes the body, what constitutes the self, like... But these yeah. are, I guess now we're at this like quasi-religious element, so like I might as well just like... So what of, is it not the body? Yeah, and I think it's like, yeah. you know, what those questions are asking really come, you know, not only in these like process of this combination of growing and doing its thing, but like with the tumbleweed, it's very much like you're harnessing the ephemerality that's inherent to its propagate, like it's meant to die in order to spread life, which, you know, in a... And this is a very, like, you know, not specifically Judeo-Christian, really specifically Christian mm -hmm. belief. There's a lot of resurrection in this idea of, like, death being required to bring life, but there's almost a sacrificial element in the way that the tumbleweed has evolved that, like, I feel there are these, like, larger spiritual elements that go beyond an established religion that really kind of, like, come out to this cosmic level. And I, I don't know, starting in this extremely, you know, very not uh, specific area, like, yeah. where do these ideas of, like, time and transformation kind of play into the way that you explore material? Yeah, I think um, when I am either using certain language or, like, thinking about things in a particular way, it does, like, have some sort of, like, religious connotations, but when I think about things like the divine, um, it's not like uh, monotheistically, it's not tied to a particular practice. Um, but I, I think it, when I'm experiencing the environment, the landscape, and I'm looking very closely at these living things um, and looking for systems, systems of connection, I think it has those ways to like lead back to spirituality or I don't well it's like a, it's like I don't want to say like higher order because I don't think that's right language for that mm -hmm. but like a larger connection a lot of what I'm doing is also thinking about time um, the time in which things are growing or like transforming um, time in which like I understand them or when they will change and I have to greet them in a new way and see how things are moving and altering. And um, I often like feel really bad about ceramics because once it's fired, it's sort of like in that form. And unless there's like uh, an intervention, like either breaking or like maybe an addition that you're going to glue onto it or something, it, that's what it is. It can't transform as easily as, let's say, a SCOBY can. Um, even though I've frozen the newer pieces, they've come back to life. It's um, crazy. Actually, if, uh, whenever we are back open to the public, we do invite you to come and check out Nicole's uh, newer SCOBY canvases, which were installed right before we were obliged <laughs> yeah. to close. Yeah. So it's actually been a really interesting time to observe how these frozen and seemingly dead organisms have returned to life in a very slow but steady way. 
And I think it's just like, you know, the way you describe sort of the way you, you looking for systems at all these different levels with the vascularity of leaves and our mm -hmm. own vascularity, it's almost like you're looking for the patterns at the macro level that exist at the micro. And I think that's a big thread that runs through, you know, what we're learning about like quantum physics and the nature of the universe and how spirals, you know, yeah. persist at a galactic level, but they're also in a snail shell. And it's yeah. this very fascinating like repetition. And I, I mean, I personally agree with you that I don't necessarily see it as a sign of an, in an inherent design principle, mm. but more that what is it about these forms that entropy tends towards? I, I don't think, know. Yeah, I think, um, what is it? Science describes what we know, and philosophy talks about what we don't quite know, and things are never solid. Like, um, yeah, of course. So like, okay. <laughs> it's like, now we have to come to terms with something that we didn't understand before. So now it's like the porousness of reality, the permeability yeah. of our cells. And it's a very like disorienting idea, but at the same time, I feel like it's sort of a liberating idea. And it allows you to kind of see these really, really fundamental connections and all of the things that surround us and sort of the, the transformability of matter, but also the inherent state of matter as existing. Yeah, it's a <laughs> yeah. It's like okay. So if you tell yourself you're gonna just try to be as present as you can in the moment and like go with the flow and not try to like immediately interpret something, but it's that's a, a practice in in itself. It's hard. Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this piece a little bit more because it's like okay. So the ceramic is of is like we identify that as like of the earth. It's mine, but this is the widest clay I could find, which means you have to go find that in the environment where it's one rock which has dissolved itself in one place. The moment it like goes on a journey down a river or like goes on a landslide, it picks up iron, um, and then it turns red or black or whatever. But it's only white if it stays in place. Uh, so even though it's like, yeah, it's clay, but someone had to try really hard to find where the source was. Uh, and then it was mined and processed and packaged and shipped to Houston, Texas. And I, <laughs> Where does it originate? I, I can't tell you on that. Interesting. But there's, there's like, I want to say like four major porcelain sites. Okay. Um, and there's like a, there's a whole history. I'm not. Well, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that today. But it's like, so you have this like highly processed clay, and then what's connecting it is caulking material, which is like what you use in your bathtubs, um, around sinks, uh, around windows. So this is like an outdoor six-year caulk. So I can say, okay, so. If this is outside, this will theoretically stay together for six years. But, <laughs> but it's going under a tree, we don't really know. But you, I think people would automatically identify the cock as like the foreign, the man-made. Uh, but the porcelain is just as touched, just as processed as the cock. And the cock, um, if we're thinking about what makes the material, it's most likely a petroleum base, which we're looking at plants, dinosaurs, marine life. So if you think like, oh, what's natural or what's unnatural, um, there's nothing extraterrestrial about this. <laughs> but, um, but it's just like trying to think about the extended time of materials. Which I think in this case is interesting and a good segue into this little portion here. So. Um, you know, we like to do a little show and tell portion. Nicole has been really great about meshing these theories and processes and materials into this discussion. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll just like sort of officially <laughs> kick off this portion of the conversation. I just want you to sort yeah, of yeah. just, what's the name of this piece? You yeah. know, where's it going? Why is it going there? Um, just so y'all know, this is going to be on view. 
as a part of our in-residence exhibition of resident artists work, which there will be work in the Ashford Gallery, but this piece will be in our craft garden, so I'm really excited about that. So I'll let you continue to sure. explain. So when I originally applied for the residency, I wanted to um, research litho paints. So what that is, is like a carved image in translucent porcelain. Translucent porcelain is, um, you saw as you saw earlier, light can pass through. Um, and so at first I was thinking about what the landscape looked like prior to development. So whenever you look out one of the windows, um, you would see what Houston looked like before uh, development, I guess. Like what lived here before us. Um, and as like COVID started to kick off, I, I was thinking more about like, okay, I really want to get away from those built systems um, and make an object that was out, like away from or detached from architecture. Um, so this is called Glomus. A Glomus is a benign tumor which grows um, usually at the tip of the finger or under the nail. Um, and it regulates temperature. So well, not the tumor, but the system regulates, regulates temperature. So it has a lot, I was thinking primarily about like touch and like how the effect of touch interacts with, with behaviors. Um, I guess thinking about origins of viruses or like the way we are moving through the environment or what we're doing um, and how our direct hands are causing these <laughs> events yeah. or results. And I, I really do believe that um, as humans, like we have this potential to have a really positive relationship with the environment. Um, we're really smart and <laughs> we're good at moving things around. So um, we could change things. Um, so what I'm thinking, <laughs> so Glomus, um, literally it's a tumor that's going to be within the garden. Um, I think it's a really interesting like metaphor, not just for the sort of like, you know, unshackability of humanity, the sort of touch and then effect and then sort of not look at the downstream effects of what we do. It's like a butterfly effect on like a, you know, manifold huge scale like uncalculably large but like also this idea that you know a globus in a very practical sense for you as an artist would be a big hindrance you know this idea that tactility as an experience and a transformative thing an effective thing mm -hmm. like it also comes down to could I do what I need to do if I didn't have my full tactile abilities like what would that look like so does that mean you like I'm not gonna even think about that. We can like skate over that question. Skating over it. <laughs> but I think maybe, you know, it might be interesting to unpack maybe some of the process yeah. of developing this. Because I know you did a lot of research into it, and it's been an amazing thing to really watch you really wrestle with this like advanced concept and this new technique that you've developed that's absolutely amazing. And one thing that I know you'll probably mention, but when it's installed in the craft garden, it will be lit from inside, right? Yes, yeah, so um, I have solar lights uh, inside of this Glomus, so um, and it might be even more interesting at night, but <laughs> who knows? Um, but it will be, it will make its presence known both in day and night. Um, so during the day, it will have the direct sunlight, and at night it will be powered yet again by sunlight, but in a different form. Um, this is an extremely experimental technique for me. Um, normally, when I'm making work, it's like, okay, so I'm starting from the idea either it's going to be inside, which means it will be in a gallery, on a pedestal, under plexiglass, very protected, temperature regulated, or I'm going to take it outside and it's going to be in conversation with everything around it. So 
if a tree branch falls onto it, is it going to shatter? Um, that was like the biggest framework on how I had to develop the sort of stitching or glue, gluing, piecing together of all these porcelain fragments. Um, so, <laughs> this might make people nervous, but after a while, I, it really started to behave like a skin. Um, if you were to take one of these pieces, no, <laughs> and just break it, this has no treatment, so it's extremely fragile. Um, but I'm not going to break this because it's done. It's done. I'm not going to do it. But if if you were to like try and poke or like crack one of these. Um, it has to give. It might have that hairline fracture. However, it's not going to fall to pieces. Um, so I'm sort of like not fighting whatever happens to it, uh, but I'm trying to meet it with the best outcomes. Well, this kind of reminds me of how, you know, a little bit earlier you were talking about sort of the object and the life it takes on once it leaves mm -hmm. you. And, this concept of you know your connection to an object and then once it's not in your possession once you release it into public view or in this case into nature yeah. then it has its own destiny you want to talk a little bit about more like how you think through that idea of the object and its continued life right so um, sometimes it's more obvious when I say uh, artwork has its own life um, sometimes it's literal <laughs> sometimes it's really just living um, but I really do believe that when we put things, when we create things, they have their own life, they have their own um, lifespan. Um, things happen to them, like this is an extension of my thought process, my desires, uh, but it's kind of its own thing now. It's, you know, it's going off, it's going to give it its old college try. <laughs> and, um, you know, birds are going to poop on it like any other great outdoor sculpture. Um, <laughs> we have lots of lizards that live in the garden, so this might be their favorite hangout. Um, it's going to be used by other living things. It's going to join other communities. <laughs> um, we don't know what this is going to come to be. Um, hopefully, well, we have bees. We have beehives on the roof. Uh, maybe a bee will be like, oh, this is this is where I want to live. Yeah. And then it will become a built environment for for bugs. But um, once it's done, once I decide I'm not going to alter it anymore, it is its own thing. It's on its own path. Which I feel like you kind of sometimes have to do with art. Otherwise, you kind of and never associate yes. your own progress with the piece and that's just kind of a pathway to unhappiness yeah. so I, I think that's a very like at peace strategy yep everything is impermanent and in process and that's why I feel like if you embrace this inevitability like it is free it's like very intense and you're like oh my god like the universe is, is intentionally slowly coming apart, but also, and then we'll oh well, back together. Yeah, because it'll eventually come back together. There's this like I won't see it, but <laughs> but it'll happen. <laughs> no, and, you know, like whatever con yeah. atoms are a part of my body, like may yeah. float around at some point in some form, and maybe it will be there. But that's very high level and a little bit woo woo. Um, there is there is no remainder in the universe. There is no remainder. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. There you go. Science! Science! <laughs> On that note, um, maybe we can go ahead and visit this mold and see oh. if a little more time has gotten it looser. Okay. Um, and so while we get ready to do that, have our... Oh, by the way, thanks so much to Catherine, who's been our wonderful showrunner and our incredible camera panner during this session. So we really appreciate you, Catherine, for that. Also, um, as Nicole prepares to demold um, and test this out, Please, 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 if you have any questions you've been dying to ask, thoughts, sound off in the chat. We'll be getting to your questions here shortly. So there's so. always cleanup. Um, 
and so with experience, you kind of learn when you can push and try and take something out earlier than you ought to. Um, is there a, like, are there different, this is again me saying like I don't know much about it, are there different names? I know that there's like a leather hard like thickness, there's like a slip which is the water. What kind of, is there like a term for how it is at this moment? Yeah, too wet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so, okay, so uh, clay is, goes through many processes. Um, casting slip is not just like clay mixed with water. It also has a chemical deflocculant. And what that basically means is that uh, normal clay and its electrical charges want to like lump together and form this solid. Um, when you use a deflocculant, it sort of like changes the electric charge of the clay particles and it makes it sit like bricks. Um, wow. And so water flows through those. So as you can see, like this is still drippy. <laughs> so, but, so, um, so this casting slip, which is different than like a super wet clay, but... Um, Does working in like a relatively high humidity area also affect kind of these sorts of drying times? Yeah, so um, clay is re really responsive to the environment in which you're making it. Ah, too soon. Can we see the top? That was very cool. Too soon. Um, so if, so when I was working in Lubbock, Texas, uh, it was very dry. Um, things would dry pretty pretty quickly um, so you really didn't want to forget anything but in Houston it takes way longer um, even though it's too soon <laughs> uh, even, even though we have like AC um, I still find that like these were oh so these molds were actually stored at my other studio which is box 13 um, when I first moved to Houston, I was kind of like looking for uh, a group of artists that I could be like work alongside and um, sort of be connected with. And so um, I had it's in Magnolia Park. It's like 10, 15 minutes away, but uh, we keep keep the AC pretty low, so. Well, I think we can give we, I think we can give the audience a, a close up of that tooth top because it came out really beautifully. Okay. And then <laughs> once you've done that, maybe we can get some audience questions. So you guys, sometimes things don't work out, and that's okay. So I'm just um, when this is done, I'm just gonna rip this up and reconstitute, and matter continues. All right. So something else. Audience questions. Well, so you you have gotten a couple of questions that wanting to know a little bit more information about the um, the plant that you're getting the leaves impressions for for like the litho planes. Do you have any information on what type of plant that is? Or I would love y'all to come to the craft garden and I'll show you. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Very good marketing. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, yep. but it is sourced from the craft garden, um, in addition to uh, Nicole's other experiments. Uh, a lot of our resident artists, we've been really, really excited about how much engagement with our craft garden has been ongoing. And so we really hope that, you know, when you do come back and visit us, you do check out our craft garden. We have so many wonderful volunteers who put so much work into it. And artists like Nicole make such interesting experimentation and discoveries with it. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, and there, we are going to be filming this piece and like making some video because we do know that like times they are changing. Um, so if you can't come and see the piece, like you can check out the There'll site be some digital, or digital content. So the it. top ripped off, but it's still got its little feet. Cute. Oh. <laughs> so that could be a really sad planter. Oh, or, <laughs> actually, I want a tooth planter. Oh my god, that's a great idea. So, okay, well, let's put it in that. <laughs>
Do we have any other questions from the audience? We do. Uh, Brittany asked, what has been your biggest struggle in creating the piece for the garden? Oh, well, um, so I built this the inside out, basically. So what we're looking at is not what I saw as I was creating it. Um, so these peaks were the low points, and the high points were actually flipped. So like as I'm trying to piece these things together, um, I'm thinking of them as like a puzzle. So something like might flow nicer in a certain spot. Um, the issue was that they, I would often find the right puzzle piece for the curve, and then once I knocked the wire armature I was sitting on, it would all tumble. So it, it was a lot of like replacing, replacing. This took me at least like four months to make from start to finish. So um, I don't know where all the time went, but. None of us do. Oh, Any, okay. Anything that happens during this like last few months, it just it could be a week or a day. It all feels like a blur. So yeah, I feel like as an outsider, I just want to say I've watched its progress and I've watched you work, and it's yeah. really it's really been inspiring. And I think people are going to get a lot out of seeing this piece in person. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah. I love the audience asking questions. I know, very. Uh, active audience. So Anne wants to know, how long does it take to make the mold? Oh, so um, it really depends on how many parts of the mold. The tooth um, is a five-part mold. This was obviously a one-part mold. Um, I could make this leaf mold in maybe a half hour. Uh, this five-part mold definitely took me at least six hours because each time you do a part you have to um, build different clay walls you have to pour the plaster wait for it to set reconfigure the next sections um, the issue with making a mold is that uh, if there are any undercuts or places that the plaster might grab onto then the mold won't work that's why I have these little lines drawn on this model. Um, this is where the mold lines are. So I often spend a lot of time just like holding the object or turning it around to try to find if there's going to be a space where it might get stuck. Um, it, take, it takes a long time and if, if you don't do it correctly you find out on the first pour and then you have to start all over. Wow. Well, as a, as a follow-up question, uh, she also wants to know if you can use different kinds of clay with the mold. Yeah, so um, you can use, I use casting slip because um, it provides like this really smooth, seamless surface, um, but you can also experiment with that. So you could roll coils of any kind of clay and put like rolls of coils or like jade clay chunks to see what that looks like. Um, if you really wanted, you could also use paper pulp or air dry clay or wax or sugar. I don't know. <laughs> you, like, you can try as many things as you want. That's great. Um, Brittany was kind of curious to know um, what treatment you used on the leaf. The, and I'm assuming the porcelain. Yeah. So the the clay leaves were fired once in the kiln. Um, usually, like when you think of ceramics, it has a glaze. So like this has a clear glaze on it to make it food safe. Um, if a glazed object is like hit with a rock or a branch, it's going to shatter. So instead, um, I used uh, resin. Resin, epoxy, and caulk. So um, these things are more flexible. Um, ceramic is really sensitive to shifts in temperature. So if this were going in Wisconsin, um, 
it would the the cold winters would definitely affect the ceramic in a very different way than if it always stayed in Houston. Um, and so this sort of like plasticky uh, materials allow it to shift. Um, so it sort of relaxes, <laughs> then, then shatters. Clay does not, ceramic does not bend, it breaks. So you have to do something else to, to extend its... Yeah, and in this case you created a membrane yeah. to hold these brittle, untreated pieces yes. together. And so that's like the skin, it's almost like they're scales or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. Interesting. It like at the at the end, like this definitely felt um, like I was a taxidermist almost. Yeah. And, like like dealing with this pelter out. <laughs> yep. Yep. It was it, again like a very odd like bodily association, uh, which I wasn't expecting, but fascinating. We we have uh, more questions. Let's get in. it. So um, I'm gonna try to get through a good selection. Uh, Carolina wants to know whether or not you feel like there are similarities with uh, the casting and the scobies that you're working with. I think um, I'm actually I'm headed towards a, a new series of work now that this is finished um, where I've been thinking a lot about these vessel forms and combining them with SCOBY. Uh, con conceptually, I really think of the vessel um, as a container for a void. So the, the emptiness, the void exists because the walls are there. Um, so it's sort of, <laughs> it becomes this like metaphorical, like there's no void without a body to internalize it. Whoa, I love the void. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna lie, I love the void. I love talking yeah. about the void. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like combining the means for the void with this embodied this embodied thing. It, I mean <laughs> so it, it's like um again just thinking again about like existence, whoa. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. We have another good question from Sharon. She wants to know if the SCOBY's uh, pieces change color with age. They do. So um, I was very surprised with the three uh, on this main wall, especially uh, over time. I actually I stored them in the garage. And so with a couple Houston summers, um, of the heat and the moisture, it really like deepened their color. Um, they used to be much lighter, and now that they, they have like this almost like tobacco or like fruit leather sort of appearance and feel to them. Um, I have to admit, like I I touched my own piece in the hallway, and uh, where I touched it, now there's like these raised bumpy areas that are growing. I don't believe they're mold. I think it's the SCOBY body that's reactivated after being frozen. <laughs> so you, that even has like a color um, change happening now. Well, um, <laughs> about the thing we heard nothing about and also <laughs> did not internalize, that's fascinating that these things that have gone through <laughs> such a, like a essentially yeah. killing process have yeah. yet retained the ability to live, which I guess sort of makes me think about like, how do we discover yeast for brewing? And like all these things that you were thinking, like talking about earlier, yeah. like provenance of process. That's really interesting. Uh, any other questions? So, let's see. Uh, Cassandra wants to know where you get uh, inspiration for your creations, which I know well, we kind of talked a little bit about, but is there anything else you would like to, any other words? Sure. Um, sometimes they just appear finished in my mind, and um, then my task becomes to like, how do I make it? So, um, so again, like this glow mist piece in my mind, 
gravity has no effect. It's like the conditions are always perfect. So the peace in my mind is like the ideal that exists only within me. And then this is like the, the results of my efforts and experimentation um, and being more in conversation with the actual material rather than this like mystery material in my mind that I can just so easily manipulate. Um, so it's, they come finished in my mind or sometimes they're a dream or oftentimes it's something that I really want to express to someone about something in particular but don't quite know how to use words to do that or that it's a little too complicated um, to use words. And so I like try to find the, either the material or the process that can sort of start that conversation or carry that feeling. Well, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Do we have anything else on the docket? I think that's everything. Awesome. Well, this has been an incredible audience. Thank you guys so much for your incredibly insightful and awesome questions. Um, Nicole, thank Thanks. you so much for opening your studio and giving us your valuable time and yeah. your knowledge. It's been such a pleasure. Um, I'm really excited for everyone to return, see us, to see Nicole's work, not only in residence in the craft garden, but here in the hallway to experience her process firsthand and to get a chance to learn more about her in person. So with that, that's the end of our studio session here with Nicole Lemire. We really look forward to seeing you at the next one, which will be announced soon in our socials. Um, and until then, we'll see you next craft time, next craft channel. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> That's, from <laughs> That's from my favorite YouTube cooking show, Mom She. She's like, bye. 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 bye.